Now let's continue a little bit. We said nucleation rate is given by this for so-called homogeneous precipitation. Homogeneous precipitation. We said uh, something like this. Okay. And then what are we looking at? This is still the part of the binary phase diagram. This is our so-called uh, from here to here. This is our phase boundary. Above it is single phase alpha. Below it is two phase alpha plus beta. And uh, let's say our system composition is x0. Make sense? And the equilibrium temperature is TEQ. Make sense? Here. That's our equilibrium temperature. Make sense? And then I'm going to ask you, kind of plot something like this. Temperature still vertical, data G horizontal. Data G horizontal. When for this x0 composition, when I'm at uh, TEQ, what is my data G? The, the, I'll put it another way, your driving force, data GV. When I'm at this temperature, what is my driving force for data GV? The word driving force. Almost zero, right? Because I'm right at phase boundary. And then as we go lower in temperature, as we go lower in temperature, this data G, the driving force should become what? Larger and larger. You see that? This is our, as we go down, this is lower temperature. So we are going to have something like this represent our data GV term. Make sense? The volume free energy driving force. When I'm at equilibrium, it's zero. And then as we go this way, we what? Increase or decrease temperature from top to bottom. Decrease temperature, our driving force become larger. Make sense? Go down here. Driving force become larger. On the other hand, we said we are dealing with solid precipitation. That's always so-called the volume strain energy. Volume strain energy. I have to spend some energy to what? Spend some of my driving force to what? To accommodate this volume change. And the effect is actually something like this. At the same temperature, my driving force become what? Smaller. Do you see that? Because uh, let's say I'm at this temperature. Initially, if I don't consider volume change, my driving force is this value. But because in reality, there is what? Volume mismatch. I have to push everybody around. I have to, what? When you want to push everybody around, you have to what? Spend energy. Means your actual driving force has to go from this value to a little bit uh, lower. Make sense? Which means, in reality, I would have another curve, something like this. Data GV minus my strain energy term, which means what? At every given temperature, my driving force become, remember, here is zero. From here to here, it's becoming smaller. Make sense? Because where does that energy go? It has to overcome this volume misfit. Make sense? So as a result, this would be our kind of a quote, uh, uh, a, a apostrophe equilibrium temperature. T prime equilibrium means even though the thermodynamic equilibrium temperature is here, when we start to consider the so-called volume misfit, I would have a somewhat temperature slightly lower than this to be my so-called equilibrium temperature. Make sense? I need a little bit lower than this to give me my zero data G. A little bit. Okay. And then from T prime to T prime, which means what? If I have system X zero, when I start from here, when I go to just the barely below here, I can overcome what? I have a volume free energy, but I'm not enough to overcome what? The volume misfit. I have to quench a little bit further to here. You see what I mean? I have this composition. If I just quench to here, 
two things. One is my undercooling is too small, my critical nuclear size is too large, that's one. But on the other hand, my driving force is not even enough to what? Overcome the volume is fit. I have to at least quench to here. To at least to quench to here to for the process to go. From both nucleation point of view and also from the barrier, the volume is fit barrier point of view. Okay? And then, which means in reality, our undercooling, I should, instead of counting from this point, I sh in reality, if we consider volume is fit, I have to count from here to somewhere lower. Make sense? It's just your undercooling effect becomes a little bit smaller than what you think you should. Okay? So that's what we said. And then I'm plotting data G homo star. Remember, what is data G homo star? Star means that critical barrier for homogeneous nucleation. And uh, when the temperature is very close to my equilibrium prime, the barrier become what? Remember, data G, this way is going larger. When I'm getting very close to my equilibrium temperature, my data G, my data G star, the barrier become higher and higher. Make sense? That's what we learned. On the other hand, when we go to lower and lower temperature, my barrier become smaller and smaller. Make sense? It, which is another way to say, if I'm just the barely below here, the probability of finding a, criti a cluster that is larger than the critical size is high or low. When I'm just just barely below here, the probability of finding a cluster that is larger than the it's small, right? It's very small. It's not likely to find something like that. On the other hand, you quench it enough to here. You may find a more higher probability of finding a cluster of that critical size. Or you have a higher probability of overcoming the barrier. Okay? That's the same thing. Again, I'm going to plot temperature versus a probability term. Now let's look at this term, the blue one, the one that we highlighted in blue. It has subscript of M means what? M for migra migration, or in other words, just simplify the diffusion barrier, diffusion activation energy. Okay? And we said diffusion activation energy does not really change with temperature. So, in terms of probability, the probability of overcoming the diffusion barrier should uh, go which way? As we increase the temperature from here, very low temperature to increase the temperature, the probability of overcoming the diffusion barrier should what? Increase with temperature. Make sense? So, that gives us this curve. As we increase the temperature, the probability of overcoming this diffusion barrier become higher and higher. Because data GM is what? Constant. Data GM is constant. As we increase T, as we increase T, 1 over T becomes smaller, minus become, which means it becomes higher, and then exponential become higher. Make sense? So what does this mean is the higher the temperature, what we learned, the higher the what? D4 diffusion coefficient, which means the greater quite often the frequency of adding atom. When the temperature is really, really low, means there's almost no what? Diffusion. If there's no diffusion, are you adding atom onto a existing cluster? No. Make sense? That's one aspect. On the other hand, now let's look at this term. The term that is high, underlined in red, okay? This one tells us the probability of finding a cluster that is at the size of that critical nuclear size. Because for this term, it's a tricky thing. T changes with what? 
temperature, of course. But we said that a GM also changes with what? Temperature. And interestingly, the top one would overwhelm this one. The top one, because the T is linear, this one is changed much faster. And as a result, and as a result, as we increase the temperature, remember this increase, the temperature, the data GM increase is like this. As we increase in temperature, actually this probability of finding a cluster become what? Smaller. So that's what we're going to draw. As we, I'll put it another way, as we decrease the temperature, we would have higher and higher probability of what? Finding that critical cluster. Or as we increase in temperature, the probability of finding that cluster become almost zero. You don't find that cluster. Make sense? So these are the two parts. The blue one is actually for probability of what? Overcoming diffusion barrier. For diffusion to happen, the probability of adding atoms. The red one is actually the probability of identify or find a critical nuclear size. And the, because of these two effects, our overall so-called the nucleation rate plus temperature versus N4, N4 nucleation rate. The overall nucleation rate quite often from material point of view, very importantly, people find it quite often looks like this nose-shaped curve. The probability of precipitate to nucleate has a nose-shaped curve. Means what? If we are very close to the equilibrium temperature, the nucleation rate is what? If we are very close to the nu equilibrium temperature, our nucleation rate is what? High or low? Low. On the other hand, if we are very low in temperature, very, very low in temperature, down here, our nucleation rate is also what? Low. In between, we have well this and that envelope, that blue and the red envelopes in between, is our so-called maximum nucleation rate. Make sense? What that it tells us is, if I'm at here, um, the diffusion is what? Fast or slow? Where well, I'm pointing, if I'm here, the diffusion is fast or slow? High temperature means diffusion is high. High temperature, remember the blue one, high temperature when I'm here, the diffusion term is high. The probability of overcoming the diffusion barrier, this term is high. You are going to overcome the diffusion barrier. But if I'm here, what doesn't happen? You cannot find the critical size of nucleus. You cannot find anything that is larger than you are at the size of your, what you want, the critical size. So if I quench just to here, does precipitation happen? No. On the other hand, if I quench it to too low, what it would happen? If I'm at here, my diffusion happen or not really happen? No, because the probability of overcoming the diffusion barrier is too low. The temperature is too low, everything got frozen. Diffusion doesn't happen. The atoms essentially move or do not move. Do not move. But at the same time, I can what? Although I can find high probability of clusters that are above my critical size, I'm not adding atom to it. So if I'm very low temperature, my nucleation rate is also low. But in between, I have a reasonable diffusion rate. I also have a high probability of finding that cluster. As a result, I have a high nucleation rate. These types of so-called nose-shaped curve is very, very important for many of the metal processing. Not so much for ceramic, but very much for metal processing. So as a result, if you are doing aluminum, you want to form so-called aluminum precipitate to make the aluminum stronger for airplane application, you are going to do what? Go from single phase, quench, but you are going to quench 
experimentally to not to too high temperature, not to too low temperature. You quench to too high temperature, you wait, your precipitate do not come. You quench to too low temperature, you wait, your precipitate also do not come. It's somewhere in between you quench, you get your precipitate coming out at maximum rate, maximum density. Make sense? So that's kind of the, the tricky part for material engineering. And this quite often is highly specific from system to system. The quenching temperature, the undercooling, the proper undercooling is different from aluminum to titanium for every material is different. Make sense? That's the tricky part. Okay. And then a little bit, uh, let's go a little bit further. Impact of supersaturation on undercooling. Supersaturation means what? Supersaturation or undercooling on our nucleation rate. First, let's look at uh, the same composition X1. Okay, the same composition X1. If we are going to plot nucleation rate versus temperature, remember, nucleation rate versus temperature, we start from here, we would have a what shape? What shape? So called uh, nose shape, right? This is, let's say this is our equilibrium temperature. Let's for now neglect the volume stuff. For now, let's neglect the volume stuff. We would have a kind of a nose shaped curve. Make sense? When I'm above this nose tip, I'm too high in temperature. I have high diffusion, but uh, too low probability of finding cluster. When I'm below this nose, what happens? I have a high probability of finding cluster, critical cluster, but I, my diffusion is too slow. So in between, I have the fastest what? Nucleation rate, okay? For the same composition. So what they see is under cooling. It depends. Under cooling, for the same saturation, intermediate temperature or intermediate data T, your under cooling gives you the fastest nucleation rate. Precipitation nucleation rate. Make sense? This. On the other hand, if we have quenched to the same temperature, but we have two different what? Composition between these two, which one, if we quench to them to the same temperature, which one would give us the higher so-called supersaturation? X1 or X2? If we quench them to the same temperature, which one would have higher supersaturation? X1 or X2? If I quench both metals, to this temperature, which one has higher supersaturation? Definitely this one, right? Definitely this one. So if I have two different uh, alloy composition, but we quench them from the same point to the same ending temperature, the one with the larger supersaturation would give us the faster nucleation rate. The one with the smaller supersaturation would give us the lower nucleation rate, which means kind of we draw it something like this. If we quench, the two composition would also nucleate, but the t absolute nucleation rate would be a little bit lower. Make sense? Because of the lower undercooling, a uh, lower supersaturation. Okay. And uh, another complication that we dealt with in precipitation is, in many cases, the nuclear shape is, in reality, not spherical. Even though in the very beginning, homogeneous, we said that for simplicity, assume it's spherical. But in reality, it's not spherical, most cases. And uh, we would try to match along certain crystal plane or orientation in order to, what? lower or minimize the interfacial energy, okay? And the precipitation of metal stable, metal stable, which means not the most stable one, the semi-stable one. This is quite happen a lot for titanium alloy, for aluminum alloy. Quite often you end up the precipitate is not even the beta phase. They call it a theta prime, theta double prime, all that uh, metal stable phase. That's a very complex, okay? Less driving force, but less also less barrier. You try to form those phase, which may not be absolutely most stable, but they have a lower barrier to go to. 